pray right now. Dear Lord, once again, we thank you so much for this privilege of, of having your word that you gave to us. We pray right now that you would use this time to bless people. And specifically this evening, use this time to heal. Uh, this can be a very healing message from this unusual chapter. We pray right now that you would just bless each of us individually as your word does its work. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, yes, we're back to the clean, unclean thinking again. Chapters 11 and 12 introduced us to clean, unclean. And an interesting thing about that is in chapters 11 and 12, being unclean was not a sin. But everything in the law points us to sin, reminds us of sin. And one of the horrible things about the law is it gives us consciousness of sin. It's designed to put sin in our face and make us look at it. <clears throat> but when it came to unclean, in chapters 11 and 12, it didn't, didn't involve um, sacrifices or offerings. It just involved washing, clean, separating yourself from other people, uh, cleaning your clothes. And during that time, you weren't allowed to participate in tabernacle activities or be involved um, in getting close to God. And um, Hebrews 10, 1 and 2, I'm just going to read this. It says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of those things. So the law is a shadow of everything. The law itself is just a, it's a model we talked about earlier, like an architectural model. It said, could never with those same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. All the sacrifices they did annually, every year, every month, the daily ones, it says, could never make anybody perfect. It says, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. If the offering, the sacrifice actually perfected you, you wouldn't have to keep doing it. And it says, in fact, if that happened, the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. I think this is an important thing to balance our study of the law with, and that is, once the law has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be Christ conscious, not sin conscious. And the law is what makes us sin conscious. We wouldn't realize we're sinners without the law. One of the primary purposes of the law was to let you realize that you're not as perfect as you think you are. And there is a perfect God that you have to compare yourself to. And as a result, once you get an honest assessment of that, you realize you're totally unclean, totally um, sinful, in the leprosy sense. <clears throat> and this next chapter is kind of no different, but we have a distinction between unclean, requiring a sacrifice like leprosy did, if you ever got out of it, and um, other, other uncleans. And if you recall, we mentioned again, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, you're already clean by the word I spoke to you, but you still need your feet washed. And we're going to see here in this next chapter, the real, it's a model for the teaching on personal sin versus sin nature. Jesus Christ paid for our personal sins, but he died as a representative of the human race for the fact that we are all sinners. That's why the atonement is unlimited. And that <clears throat> means that he paid for the sinfulness of humanity but we have to accept that payment to receive it for payment for our personal sins. So being sinners is one thing. Personal sin is a separate thing. Uh, this is one reason that children, babies, go to heaven <clears throat> because their sin nature, the fact that they are sinners, has been paid for. But accountability hasn't happened yet. This idea of consciousness of sin... <clears throat> um, Chapter 15, in a nutshell, is going to be talking about secret sins. Sins that no one else knows about. And you're kind of on your honor in this chapter to do what the chapter says. Like anything else in Leviticus, it has its practical side, the medical side. It has the portion that is 
teaching the Israelites what fellowship with God is all about and the requirements needed to approach God. <clears throat> but once again, you have the uncleanness that happens in everyday life. We go through life every day. We have unclean thoughts and attitudes and the things come upon us. We hear things, we see things, and those things do make us unclean. And we respond by prayer and just the word of God comes along and we're, we're fine. And the other personal sin is when we have those unclean things and we, we choose to hang on to them. We sit there and let them fester. We sit, we, we meditate on them. Uh, unforgiveness, that can be a passing thought or it can be a grudge that lasts forever. And that's the distinction we have here in this chapter. So this chapter, quite frankly, is speaking about um, unsavory things. In a nutshell, is talking about male and female discharges. It's talking about semen and blood, okay? Seed and blood. I'm not going to overemphasize that too much. You'll get the picture. It's probably the main reason people, when they start reading this chapter, just decide to skip it. So I normally go through things like this one verse at a time and let it kind of explain itself. But there's a structural thing here I want to focus on. So I'm going to give you the outline of the bulk of the chapter. And there's four major things. It starts out with abnormal male discharges. Abnormal um, <clears throat> things that are not normal, discharges. And um, it, does, it doesn't specify, but rabbis and throughout history has all been connected with venereal diseases. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about other options there. But it starts out with the abnormal male discharges for which a sacrifice is required. And then it goes to normal male discharges in which they're still unclean, but no sacrifice is required. Then it goes on to normal everyday female discharges, regular monthly cycles, which renders a person unclean, but no sacrifice is required. And then it wraps up with abnormal female discharges. Again, falling in the category of chronic discharges, venereal diseases, implying sexual diseases of some sort. And those four categories will, as you see, will kind of tie into what I said. The, the sins that need a sacrifice, the, the issues. King James, King James uses the word issues, and for now I'm going to say issue. When I say issue, think discharge, think gross. But then again, it's in a very appropriate pun because we all have issues. And we're going to be talking about the issues that all of us have, and some of them are passing issues that we have a pleading thought or attitude or a situation that comes, and we give it to God, and it's over with. That's just momentary uncleanness and then the other things that we may harbor or hang on to longer than we ought to. So let's go ahead and dive in. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Once again, he's speaking to both of them. For what some reason, the last chapter on the cleansing, it was spoken to Moses. Moses was the one that shared it with Aaron. Now God's speaking to both again. He says, speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, when a man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue, he is unclean. So a running issue, this means um, something abnormal. And we'll see. It says, and this shall be his uncleanness in his issue. If his flesh run with the issue, or his flesh be stopped up from the issue, it is his uncleanness. And <clears throat> it says flesh here, but in context later on, this is definitely an issue in a genital sense which is, again, private. A person could, in theory, hide this. Um, flesh is running, oozing, pussing, or is stopped up because it's all um, um, not cauterized, but like just um, skinned over. This is, this is gross, and this has to be some sort of venereal disease. There are some rabbis that say that this could also include just things like diarrhea or other sicknesses. 
but later on we'll see that really doesn't make sense. Uh, so the idea of some sort of venereal disease, things that have happened, this is long term, okay? So here is the responsibility if you have, if a man has this. Verse four, every bed that he lies on, if he has the issue, in other words, he that has the issue, if he lies on the bed, and everything where he sits is unclean. So your bed's unclean, your chair's unclean. Whatever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean for the evening. So anyone else that comes in contact with the bed or the chair is going to be unclean in the sense that you need to wash up and wait till the evening. Coming in contact does not make you unclean to the point of having to do sacrifices. But that's the first coming in contact. Verse 6, and he that sits on anything whereupon he sat has the issue shall wash his clothes. So again, a second person coming along, sitting on the chair the unclean person sat on, needs to wash his clothes and make it right. So the message here is that somebody that is really unclean, the type of unclean that's going to require a sacrifice and an offering, can in fact those he comes in contact with just peripherally or um, adjacent to anything he touches. That will cause another person to become ceremonially unclean. Then again, the lesson is, as always, sin is contagious. Sin transfers goes by contact. And verse 7, and a person that touches the flesh of him that has the issue. So coming in contact with someone who has the issue, needs to wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean till the evening. And if he that has the issue spits upon him that is clean, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean. The message here is that a person that's chronically unclean in, in any contact whatsoever is going to infect a person and make them ceremonially unclean. I'm going to use that distinction for right now, chronically unclean, an uncleanness that must wait till it's cleaned up and then requires a sacrifice versus ceremonial unclean, which <clears throat> means wash up real good, separate yourself, and wait till the evening. And so the idea that someone who is chronically unclean would spit on someone is kind of gross, but a chronic issue, and I can start the metaphor now, a person that has a secret sin, a secret issue in their life, a secret grudge, a secret uh, lust pattern, a secret self-righteous attitude, things that you know we all deal with temporarily as we walk through life, things that affect us and we dismiss them and we move on, we get right with God and it's just part of life. It's 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 something that we fall seven times in a day. Who cares? We get back up, we move on again. That is the life we have. That is the life that glorifies the great God. Um, but to dwell on it, to allow it to infect us to the point of this kind of chronic is something that affects anything and everyone we touch. So he that, if he spits on, in verse 9, and whatever saddle he rides upon, that half the issue shall be unclean. So you sit on a saddle, you climb on a, a donkey, a saddle, and wh whoever touched anything that was under him shall be unclean till the evening. So anything you sat on, anybody else comes along and touches it, it's, they're unclean till the evening. They have to bathe themselves in water and be unclean till the evening. Verse 11, and whomsoever he touches that half the issue, and hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. So it narrows it down. Touching anything you do with the unclean person becomes unclean. Verse 12, and the vessel of earth that he touches, who has the issue, shall be broken. And every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Um, I don't want to push this metaphor too far, but 
clay vessels is what we are often called. We're vessels of clay. We are made in the image of God, but we're made of the dust of the earth, vessels of clay. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that if I am living in, living in sin, living in a sinful attitude or some secret issue, that issue is going to break the clay pots around me. You have a husband that is secretly into pornography, he's going to break his wife. She doesn't have to even know about it. It's going to affect. It's going to break other people around us. We have unlimited examples of people who say, well, what so-and-so doesn't know won't hurt them. But if we have bitterness or unforgiveness towards somebody that's festering in our lives in a chronic way, it's going to eventually break the people around us. So, you know, it's easy to say things like that. And the problem is the solution, right? And we're getting to that. So <clears throat> this person here, verse 13. And when he that has an issue is cleansed of the issue. In other words, if it does go away, and, you know, if, if your STD dries up and heals, if your herpes goes away, whatever this issue is, if it goes away, and of course, you know, God heals, he's the healer, and we'll see an example of it a little bit later here. He says, when it goes away, he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, set aside seven days, wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in running water, and he shall be clean and on the eighth day. So seven days of cleanness, seven days of purification seven days of for, of completion on the eighth day on resurrection day he shall take to him two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before the lord under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and give them under the priest the priest shall offer them the one for a sin offering other for a burnt offering and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the lord for his issue so the man has an issue and it's chronic and it is basically, since he's required to do an offering, it must be, it's the metaphor here is for sin. Some, some sin led to it. And uh, in this case, it's a secret hidden sexual disease, but a um, person has to account for it and atonement must be made. And as long as he hangs on to it, he's going to be infecting everybody he comes in contact with and even breaking some of the people he's closest to. So the main reason that we don't consider everything we just started read about to be diarrhea or other types of unclean issues is this, this section here. And if any man's seed of copulation, now this is ordinary seed, okay? Regular ordinary seed go out from him. So this can be accidental or during, um, during sex. He shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the evening. And that's it. It's a one-time thing. And every garment, every skin, whereupon is the seed of copulation, shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. And the woman also with whom the man lies with the seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. Okay. So the question of this is, well, what makes that unclean? And... It certainly isn't. It certainly isn't the 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 seed the act itself. The act is commanded, right? Commanded, multiply. But we're going to have two issues here, or two. I'm going to not say issues. Two things here, and that is seed and blood. What is it about humanity that is fallen? Well, Adam sinned, and every human being after that, because you're part of Adam's seed, is contaminated with sin. So seed is, is fallen. Seed is how sin is transmitted from, from men to their children. This is still sin. And the reminder here is that seed is considered unclean because of that. It doesn't require 
an offering or a sacrifice, it's just going to be a reminder. Once again, it's just consciousness of sin in every place you look. Um, <clears throat> going back to the analogy, it's a reminder that no matter what I do, I'm still a sinner. I can do wonderful, good things, and I'm still a sinner. I can do amazing, godly things, but I'm still a sinner. And what was it? at the end of the chapter, we see how in this, in this state of unclean, in this manner, you are forbidden to be involved in the tabernacle. Head away to the evening, a reminder that you're still a sinner. In this case, you didn't commit a sinful act, but you still have a sin nature. Um, the other point at the end of the chapter is how keeping sex away from the tabernacle was a good reminder that God is different from all the other religions. All the other religions, pagan religions, that was pretty much the number one MO for pagan religions was temple prostitutes and sex as part of the, the ceremony. Um, that's how most cults wrote, raised money. So this idea that when you are ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, you, you must stay away from God for that brief period of time. It's a reminder that we're all sinners. Um, <clears throat> so let me see it is. Well, let me go on. Verse 19. Now remember the structure we gave. The abnormal male issue, normal male issue, normal female issue. This is a, a typical Hebrew structure. If we were writing this in a Western way, we say, we'd say normal male, abnormal male, normal female, abnormal female. It would be kind of like, like parallel. Hebrew way is to have the top and the bottom combined. So we're going to have the abnormals at the beginning and the end, and the normals in the middle. And you'll see here. So the woman, if she has an issue, and the issue in her flesh be blood, so this is a normal bodily discharge, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days. This is just normal cycle. And whoever touches her shall be unclean till the evening. And everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean. And everything else that she sits upon shall be unclean. So again, it's just a reminder that you have this every month and it doesn't make you a sinner, but it reminds you that human blood is sinful. I only say that because only Jesus Christ has perfect blood. In, in the book of Acts, it says that Jesus has God's blood. Redemption is a cure for human seed and human blood. The life is in the blood. The sin is in the seed. The, sin, the seed of the serpent is the seed that we carry biologically right now. The, the seed of evil. And it's only in our glorified bodies will that be ever fixed and removed. The perfect, um, the perfect seed, if you will, the, the, <clears throat> the seed of a woman, mean, meaning the offspring of a woman, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, perfect seed and perfect blood. So once again, these things are reminders of sin. And once again, this was teaching them and teaching us that sin is a default. In grace, we receive the solution for sin. We receive the cure. We talked all about that with leprosy last week. In receiving the cure, we spend all of our time focusing on the person that cured us. We go to the one that healed us, and being Christ conscious is the number one method to avoid sin in my life. If I'm sin conscious, I'm going to do what I think about. Trying to not sin while you're thinking about sin is, is, is a foolish thing to try. If I try not to think about pink elephants while I'm, you know, thinking about pink elephants, it's not going to happen. 
So the solution for sin is Jesus Christ by declaring us righteous. Um, but in this case here, verse 21, verse 22, and anyone touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and bleed into the evening. And if it be on her bed or anything where she sits, where she touches it, it should be unclean until the evening. So again, anything that comes in contact with her is unclean until the evening. And she herself is unclean during those during that time. Um, once again, the uncleanness that a woman had after giving birth in a lot of ways was a blessing. She got to spend time with her baby, got to spend double time with her female baby. In most cases here, it's a situation where the time you spent being unclean is also a time when you get some peace, you get left alone. Here, verse 20, and if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, there's the King James euphemism, it's menstrual blood, that's all it means. It's, it's not even even the Hebrew, the Hebrew is, just, is menstrual blood. Um, he shall be unclean seven days and all the bedroom upon he lies shall be unclean. So. The message to the Jewish man is if your wife's in having her period, leave her alone. And I don't think she's going to be too upset about that. <laughs> so, and I've heard some funny stories, Orthodox Jews that um, follow these rules. Their wife's on the period, and then they go to the mikvah. And there's, you know, it's, you know, public rooms for the purpose of cleansing and purification. He's, um, one of the pastors I was listening to says, the rabbis, well, the rabbi actually I was talking to, he says, he can go to the, the, the places where women go to be ceremonially washed to take their baths. Outside are Jewish men standing in lines with flowers and candy. Okay, they, they, they did their time. And um, so, woman's had her break, everything's fine, she's gonna come out, and it's time for a date night. So, uh, it, it has a, an interesting dynamic that can develop uh, because of following these rules. Being ceremonially unclean is not, by definition, a bad thing. It's a recognition that uh, I'm not perfect, but it doesn't have the weight of sin, okay? So, okay, verse 25. And if a woman shall have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation. So this is uh, abnormal. This is someone who has an issue of blood that is ongoing. Could, again, back to the venereal disease, something that's very not right. Beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of uncleanness shall be the days of her separation shall be unclean. So this is the fourth category here. And it says, every bed whereupon she lies all the days of her issue shall be unto her as a bed of her separation. Whatever she sits upon shall be unclean and as the uncleanness of her separation. So this is rough. This is as long as you have this abnormal issue, any touch is going to be unclean. Anything that you come in contact with. Um, and it's going to be unclean as long as she's unclean. This is not pleasant. Uncleanness. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. So you come in contact with people, they're ceremonially unclean. Verse 20, but if she be cleansed of her issue, if she's healed, if this abnormal issue is taken care of, she shall number herself seven days. After that, she shall be clean. So there's a common misconception here. A woman that was having a normal period is unclean during those seven days. And that was it. A lot of people think that after that, she had to wait another seven days, which makes a lot of people think most women were unclean half their lives. But that's not the case. This additional seven days is for the abnormal issue. This could be someone who's had this issue for, for weeks, for years, uh, for extended period. 
if that abnormal issue is cleansed by whatever means, then, then that's when that seven day, just like the man, if she's cleansing her issue, she shall number herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean on the eighth day, the resurrection day, she shall take under her two turtles, or two young pigeons, turtles mean turtle doves, and bring them to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, other for a burn offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, for the issue of her uncleanness. So, that wraps that up. Verse 31 is the wrap up. Thus shall you separate the children of Israel for their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness. When they defile my tabernacle that is among them. So, defiling the tabernacle. Coming to tabernacle and engaging in the activities when you had an issue. Whether it's a chronic issue or a ceremonial issue. Coming in and praising the Lord when you have a grudge in the back of your head. Coming in and saying, God is great, and waving to people and saying, I love you, Mrs. So-and-so. When you have a grudge, is something that's forbidden. But earlier on in Leviticus, and Jesus reiterated it, if you have an issue with somebody, take care of that issue before you bring your offering. Coming into tabernacle with one of these issues defiles it and of course the, the real gross defilement was the idea of sex in the temple because that's what the pagans did so verse 32 this is the law of him, him that has an issue of him whose seed goeth from him and is defiled and the one that is sick of her flowers again there's that word flowers again that's purely a king james word and of him that has an issue of the man of the woman and of him that lies with her that is unclean. So that wraps up the idea of the chapter. But um, just like we looked at examples of Jesus and lepers, we need to look at the obvious story that should be in everyone's mind right now. Let's turn to Luke chapter 8. And Luke chapter 8 is, of course, the famous story of the woman with an issue of blood. And that's exactly what it was. An issue of blood that she'd had for a long period. This is not the normal issue. This is the abnormal. So Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, we spent our living on physicians, Neither could be healed by any. She came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. Stanch. In other words, totally stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and the others that were with him said, Master, the multitudes thronging around you and pressing against you. How can you say, Who touched you? And Jesus said, Someone has touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Um, this is a woman who has an issue of blood. She is unclean. She does not belong in public. She is going against all the rules. And somehow Jesus honors her. We need to really understand what's happening here. The King James talks about the border of the garment, hem of the garment. That's a very unfortunate translation. It's a Western translation. The word there... It's called crespidon, and it can mean edge, but in this context, especially the fact that Jesus was Jewish, this is about the tassel or fringe. This is the tassel that would have been attached to the border of any good young Jewish man, but especially a rabbi. And a rabbi would have a tassel, and this tassel would indicate a lot of things about him. Tassels can become very... um personal because they can have encoded in the knots. They can say what your status is, are you rabbi? Um, um, it can have different meanings. But the fact that Jesus was a rabbi, he would definitely have had a tassel of some sort. And <clears throat> I will finish the story. The woman saw that she was not hid. She came trembling and fell down before him. She cleared him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. This is very important. 
she was healed immediately, which means she knew she was healed immediately, which means she was probably very, very shocked. She's startled, but she's a little nervous too. She's been found out. And the only time we have in the Bible that Jesus said this is verse 48. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Jesus turns, looks at her, calls her daughter, acknowledges she's totally healed. Your faith has made you whole, whole. go in peace. No seven days. She's totally healed. Like the high priest, remember the ten lepers? The one leper who was not Jewish went straight to Jesus, the high priest, and he pronounced him clean. Jesus here took authority and said, I pronounce you clean, go in peace. You're done. Like it never happened. Okay? We can all see the analogy there of salvation, but what is this tassel all about? We need to turn to Numbers 15. Numbers 15, verse 37. Numbers 15. This is one extra rule in the book of Numbers. And verse 37. And the Lord spoke to Moses and speak to the sons of Israel and tell them to make for themselves tassels on the hems of their garments throughout their generations. And put a cord of blue on the tassel of each hem. So tassels are, have to have blue cords in them. And if you see them in Israel, they're all blue. And they also have the blue hem on the garment. So the, word, the blue in the Bible stands for heaven. It can stand for deity sometimes, but that's usually purple. But blue stands for heaven. So verse 39, this will be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them. So you do not follow after the desires of your own heart. So when you see the tassel, you say, oh, I'm going to do it God's way, not my way. I see the tassel, and it reminds me that uh, God is great. God gave me commands, and I'm going to do it my way. Instead of, it says, following after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go whoring. Okay? This is rough. When you follow after your own eyes and ears, you make other things idols besides God. And God considers idolatry adultery in that you're stepping out on him. So when you do things your way, you're whoring from God's perspective. And of course, to Israel, he was saying, Israel, you're my wife. And when you don't have something to remind you that I'm your God, you're probably going to get distracted. Men, put these tassels on your, on, on your garments here. Now, the tassels also were a sign of authority. A person would reach out to touch the tassel of a rabbi to say, I'm submitting to your authority. In the New Testament, rabbis, they had their tassels, and of course, they had their own unique tassels that would indicate a variety of different things. But a person that chose to submit to that rabbi, and that's what most people did. If you follow a rabbi, you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join his school of thought. And you join the rabbi and you get with the tassel and you say, I'm submitting to your authority, okay? Now, every Hebrew male in Jesus' day wore a prayer shawl. The prayer shawl take, is, is what has the tassel on it. The prayer shawl, we've seen, you've seen them in movies or in synagogues if you've gone there. It's called a tallet, and that would have... The garment we have a tassel on all four corners with the blue thread woven in it so this woman number one she says to herself if i can just get to his tassel not just the hem it's not a cuff it's not like the cuff on a pant leg he's this that word in this context means tassel if i can get to that tassel and indicate that i am following him by just touching it going to get in there and touch it, I can get healed. But what would give her that strange idea? And we have to go to Malachi 4.2 for that. Don't, don't have to turn there right now. It's a short verse. But Malachi 
is a promise. As for those of you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves, healing in his wings. The word wings there is the same as borders in numbers. The borders are the hem, including the, the tassel. The hem and the tassel is kanaf or kanafim. So <clears throat> this woman would have said that the wings of the robe and tassels are the same thing. If I can touch his wings, she would have been thinking wings because that's the same word. Healing in his wings. The sun of righteousness, yes, I know the word sun is S-U-N in English, and in fact, it means the sun in the sky. Um, it would be so cool if it meant sun, but it, that's just an English homonym there. But even the sun in the sky is the sun of light. And unlike all the pagan sun gods, this is the sun of righteousness. Um, there's a couple of Psalms that refer to God as a sun, like sunlight. And of course, the sun is the light that God created on day four to give us temporal light to replace the Shekinah glory and the light that was there before and the light that will be there again in the New Jerusalem. But this idea of authority, we're going to do one more jump in the Bible here, and that's 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24 is the story when Saul is hunting David. Saul hunts David, and Saul decides to get 3,000 men to go out and hunt down David and get him once and for all. David's out hiding in the caves in En Gedi. And in chapter 24, 1 Samuel, says, David's in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to search for David and went to find him in the rocks of the wild goats. Okay? So, <clears throat> and they went to a place where there were some sheepfolds and there was a cave. So Saul goes inside this cave. He has 3,000 man army on the outside. And they're making noise, and they sound like 3,000 men with all their donkeys and equipment and stuff. And he goes inside a cave to pee. Okay? This is real life. He goes inside. He probably puts his armor, puts an armor guard in front of the cave, goes in privately, sets his robe down, and he relieves himself. And probably it's not, it's probably number two in this context here because, um, he takes a little while and he sets the coat aside. Now, David and his men were in the cave's recesses. Saul's hunting David. Saul goes in the cave to take care of business. And back in the back of the cave is David and all his men. And David's men say what you'd expect them to say. Behold, this is the day which the Lord says to you, I will hand your enemy over to you. And you shall do to him as seems good to you. So all of David's men say, Wow, God's delivered him. Kill him. Take him out. This is a victory. Now, David, because of his godly attitudes up to this point, refuse, has refused to hurt Saul. He said, Saul is God's anointed, and he has the office of king, and I have no business attacking him. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it. And he refuses to, but he does do something else. Then David arose in the darkness and stealthily, cut the hem off Saul's robe. Once again, this is also skirt in the King James. And once again, this is the borders, the borders in the hem. So he goes in and let's think about it from David's perspective. Oh, I can't kill him. I can't kill him. But in a moment of weakness, David says, I'm going to hurt him real bad. I'm going to cut some of the hem off his garment. I am going to deface him and attack his authority. Now David wants to honor God by honoring Saul's authority and saying that's his office and I'm going to honor it regardless. But then he fails by attacking his authority anyway. I just think of like a school kid that just does something really, really stupid because it seems like a cool idea at the moment. But what happens here is verse 5, David's conscience bothers him. His heart smote him. He goes, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. Here I am not killing Saul because I'm honoring his office. 
but I'm attacking his authority anyway. I took away that, that, that um, tassel. I cut that away off him, and that undermines his authority. He said, I didn't kill him, but when Saul finds this out, he's going to realize that um, his authority has been attacked. This really hurts David's conscience. Why? He knows the meaning of it. He understands the authority of it. The woman with the issue of blood understood the meaning. We have every right to assume that she had made a decision that Jesus was the Messiah. And as such, she had every, every um, motivation to track him down, go and get under his wings. Under his wings means to touch, touch his wings. Remember, that caliph, the border, is the same thing as wings. So if I can get, if I can touch his prayer shawl, I, have, I will have submitted myself to his wings. By putting myself under his wings, maybe he'll heal me. Because that's what Malachi says, right? He says there's healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. This is good. She's hurting. She's destitute. She's had this for 12 years, this issue of blood that we just read about. This is ugly. She has no hope, no chance of a cure, but she probably read this one verse in Malachi and said, I'm going to claim that verse. And I believe Jesus is the Messiah. He's healed lepers, right? If he's healed lepers, he can heal issues of blood. He is the one with healing in his wings. If I can get to his wings, I'll be healed. So in back to 1 Samuel, He's David's his conscience goes, Oh, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's not to put my hand against him. He's not saying the Lord forbid that I should kill him. He's already decided not to. He's saying the Lord forbid that I just did that. This is terrible. So he rebuked the men with the words, didn't let the men kill him. The men wanted to still kill Saul. He wouldn't do it. Saul left the cave. And then verse 8: David got up and went out of the cave and called after Saul and said, My Lord the king. My Lord, the king. <clears throat> he's saying he's a king, and then he bows to his face. He lays fast down. And David then asks Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, David seeks to harm you? And, of course, you know the rest of the story. He proves to Saul that he does not seek to harm him. But he also says, I shouldn't put my hand against the Lord's anointed. There's no evil or treason in my hands. I, I am not trying to seek to take over. David has, in a way, every right to take over Saul. Samuel has told David that he's going to be the king. King Saul's son has acknowledged and voluntarily told David that when my father stops being king, I will let you be king. Jonathan has every right to claim the throne. He has chosen to step aside and let David be king because... David's been invited to be king. <clears throat> so this idea of the tassel being incredible authority, this is what the woman with the issue of blood did. So in the context of Leviticus 15 here, the healing that is in Jesus. Sometimes people want healing for attitudes, healing from the consequences of sin, and maybe even physical healing. But what did this woman have to do? She had to submit to his covering. And submitting to his covering means I'm going to submit to your law, submit to your authority. For Christians, God's authority is that he's declared us righteous. As Christians, we must submit to that, regardless of how we feel on a given day. And we submit to that with thanksgiving. Dear Lord, thank you for your gift of righteousness. But I can't really receive that gift personally and practically if I have issues. Now, once again, we all have the, the ceremonial issues, the issues that come and go every day. The Bible tells us to, um, the word have I hid in my heart. The word is in our hearts so we don't sin. <clears throat> Temptations come and go. Bad thoughts come and go. Sinful attitudes come and go. And the word washes it away. 
The word cleanses us, just like the water cleansed those that were ceremonially unclean. But how about those that were chronically unclean? The ones that had issues, and I'm talking about issues. These are Christians with real issues. Issues I cannot forgive. Issues I cannot get over this person. Issues I hate that person. Issues that person's so stupid. Issues I'm better than so and so. That's the worst one, of course, self righteousness. Chronic issues. And we have this idea that I can still fellowship. This idea that I can still go to church, say, praise the Lord. Now, that's a good thing to do no matter what. And sometimes there's power in praise. Praising God may give us the power we need from God to overcome our issues. But the Bible is pretty clear about those chronic issues. We name them. We, so we, we present them before God. And he's faithful and just to forgive. You know, I don't spend my days constantly asking for forgiveness every moment for all those fleeting things that come and go. I would not do anything else if that were the case. You know, we live under the blood. We live under grace. We, we assume it in a very godly, non-presumptuous way that I'm a forgiven person and things come and go. I'm washed by the word. Jesus told the disciples, you're clean by the word I spoke. You know, you don't have to be spending your entire existence going, oh, forgive that thought, forgive that thought. We move on. But issues, chronic issues, things that I've been living with for a day or two, a week or two, a decade or two. These are things that have to be taken to Jesus and submit to the wings. You put yourself under the authority of the tassels. And you know what? Those tassels are blue. This is a reminder that no matter what issue I have, someday I'm going to be in heaven. And focusing on heaven and focusing on the big picture is a good step towards making those issues not nearly as big after all. I've got an issue. I can't forgive this person. God says you need to if you want a fellowship. I say, I can't do it. I'll love you, God, anyway, but I'm going to be loving at a distance. I can praise the Lord, but I'm going to be praising at a distance. I am not going to be able to be intimate with God, with the kind of fellowship he wants and I need until the chronic issues are taken care of. I go to God and I say, I've got this issue. I just, I, I can't stand this person. I go to God and say, um, I'm unforgiveness. I go to this God, I say, I keep living and accusing other people. I keep living in complaining all the time. I keep living in uh, being critical. These are all things we all deal with, nothing new. But to live in them in a chronic way in Leviticus is something that requires a sacrifice, requires an offering. Yes, Jesus paid the offering, but I have to receive it. I have to accept it for that situation. Um, we come to Jesus, and he turns around, and all of a sudden, we're back to face-to-face -face again. We're back to fellowship. We're back to being totally cleansed. God calls us daughter or son, as the case may be. And we're, fellowship is totally restored. There's no issue in life that can't be removed by remembering that God is in heaven, and we are too. No matter what our issues here on earth, our home is in heaven. Always remember that blue around the border. We look at Jesus and he has the blue border. And he has the tassel. We submit to it. The solution to all of our issues is to place them under the authority of Jesus. There's not too much else to be said about that. Again, I think this is a personal thing. The chapter is about secret sins. You know, um, the priests and, and other I forget one of the Old Testament prophets accused the priests of having chambers of imagery. They had nice, beautiful houses, but they had a secret room with a panel door that no one saw. You walk into that room, and that's where your idols were, you know? So if we have rooms like that in our soul, that could be a chronic issue. It's an issue that is impeding fellowship. Not impeding salvation, um, but it's impeding fellowship. Is it impeding your trip to heaven? No. 
you're going to get there no matter what, but you're not going to have as much joy on the way. You are welcome with your free will to have a miserable ride on the way to heaven. But getting rid of these chronic issues that can plague all of us, you know, and there's new ones all the time that crop up. Of course, the number one solution is to not let them become chronic. Wash them in the word and move on. Dismiss it and move on. Get right, move on. Rebound and move on. But the things that, that, that fester, the things that are gross, the things that are abnormal, the things that ooze and pus and disfigure. Um, again, in our fallen humanity, we are sinners. And God always remembers that we are dust. We have fallen seed and fallen blood. And Christ fixed all of that. I want to read this one last thing, Mark 7, and we'll finish up here. Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, if I say it a few more times, I'll get there. Sorry about that. So the Pharisees, that some of the scribes came from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, and they see some of the disciples eat their bread with some only impure hands, unwashed. It doesn't mean that they didn't wash their hands. It means they didn't do it in the proper ceremonial way that they taught you should. And so they're as they were defiled. Pharisees and Jews carefully washed their hands based on the tradition of the elders. These are oral traditions, not Bible traditions. Oral traditions always add details to the, the generic ones that God gives and creates extra rules to follow. And um, verse 5, the first of the scribes asked Jesus, why your disciples not live their lives according to the tradition of the elders? They didn't say, why don't you live your lives according to the Bible? <laughs> Just of the elders. And verse 6, Jesus said, the Isaiah prophesied about you. The people honor you with their lips, but the hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, worship meaningless and worthless. It says they teach the precepts of men as doctrines. So Jesus attacks them saying, you worship with your mouth and not your heart. And you take man-made rules and teach them like they're God's rules and they're not. Says, you disregard and neglect the commandments of God and cling to the traditions of men. You're experts at nullifying, set aside, setting aside the commandments of God to keep your man-made traditions. Uh, Jesus says, Moses said, honor your father and mother. And um, the, the Pharisees had twisted that. They said, the best way to honor your father and mother is to take their inheritance and give them to us. I'm just going to give you the, the thumbnail here. So... They said the best way to honor your father and mother is to give their inheritance to us. Not realizing that you're dishonoring them by dishonoring their, their wishes and you're not giving inheritance to the children where it belongs. Um, Jesus in this, the reason I want to read this section here is Jesus is letting the people know that he's always been concerned with the heart. It's easy for a lot of Christians to think, well, the Old Testament was all about duty and outward activity, and the New Testament is when Jesus came and said, I want your heart. God hasn't changed. God always wanted people's heart. God always wanted fellowship. God always wanted intimacy. God always wanted give and take and conversation. And the people that got to know God in the Old Testament had exactly that. And Jesus is saying that when you start Using the law to hurt people, start using the law to keep people from God rather than showing them a way to get to God, you're, you're missing the point. So Leviticus 15, a little disturbing, a little strange, but I really think as I studied this chapter this last week, I think this chapter has, can be a source of amazing healing. This chapter, if we apply it properly, is something that really can cleanse our insides. You know, David said, search my heart. 
just cleanse out our insides, let God know that well, we're not hiding anything anyway, right? God knows what's there. He already knows the running issues, the chronic issues that are there, if there are any. But to just tell God, yep, I agree with you. They're there, and I submit to your authority. Submitting to your authority means letting God use his power to remove it. God use his power to restore fellowship 100%. God use his power to say, you're my daughter, my son. You've always been that. Nothing's ever changed in the from my perspective, I always think of God and I on a telephone, an old-fashioned telephone line, okay? And when I break fellowship with God, I put my end of the phone down. He never, he never puts his end down. His end is always up. And the second I pick up my end of the phone and say, okay, sorry, God. God doesn't say, where were you? God says, welcome back. And we resume like nothing ever happened. That is the graciousness of God. But I have to be willing to <laughs> pick up the phone. I have to be willing to say, yep, I've been obsessing about this thing over here. And that obsession has been my idol. That unforgiveness is my idol. That, um, that hobby that's taken me away from God has become my idol. Hobbies are great, but not if they get in the way. Um, that mission I've been involved in is great, but if it's in the way of God, I need to put God first again. God will give things back if, he, if, if we need them to be returned to us. But we, we do this, we get back under his wings, and he touches. Remember, she went under his wings, and she was immediately healed. In the Old Testament, he had to wait to get healed. And then he went back and got all the offerings and stuff. Jesus treated her instantly. She was healed immediately. There was no need to go through any offerings because Jesus was going to be her offering. So I think that's a good sentence to end on. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being our offering. We thank you so much that you have a solution for the hidden sins, the secret sins. You have a healing that all we need to do is grab the hold of that tassel Take hold of the board of your garment. Acknowledge your authority over us. And realize that you're the Messiah. And you paid for all these sins. You cover us with your blood. And you give us perfect seed. This, the perfect seed of Jesus. The perfect, in, um, untarnished, eternal, um, sinless seed to replace our own. And God, we just thank you for this time and this this thought, and I pray that it's something that will bless people and, and stay with them for, for a few days, God. And once again, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's beautiful, John. He cleanses us white as snow, you know. As if it never happened. Yep. Huh? As if it never happened. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. Wow. Yeah, thanks so much. Man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. The teaching on the tassel was very good. It's good to understand what those tassels meant. Mm, yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yep. They're called tzitzit. T-Z-I-T. T-Z-I-T. Yeah, the, and, the, and they're made with a purple blue dye from a very special snail. Mm, mm. They are raising again and starting to make the dye again for the renewed temple. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. They've had all they've had all these uh shawls and, and seat seat made up. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when a rabbi walks past you, you want to touch the seat seat just like like the guy like the woman with the issue of blood did. It's, it's it's known still to be very special to touch it and the, and when people wear them in the temple they pick up the purple and touch the torah with it when the torah walks by wow mm -hmm. uh, it would be active commission as well uh-huh uh-huh mm. so it's a big part of the jewish temple received the prayer cloth prayer shawl from a birthday was special. Oh, really? oh great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Since I still have it inside, it's 
this case is it was special to me i i was, I was so blessed i, I uh -huh. love it and notice how many knots there are in the uh, in the tzitzit. It's a very special knot. It has to be done very carefully by the rabbis. Nobody else can do it. Wow. Yeah, this one came from Israel. Very mm -hmm. nice. Uh huh. Oh, neat. <laughs> Hi, Janice. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Say goodbye. Wonderful. Goodbye. See you, Edith Stewart. Bye, thanks. Bye, Edith. Bye, Stuart. Bye. God bless you. Got a lot Good to do night. this tonight. Well, I wish you could explain that to some of the Jewish people. They have no clue. Mm. Mm. Well, when it's nothing but ceremonial, it's, there's not right. much else you can do with it. It's so dead, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Jewish Bible says when the woman touched the tzitzit, it even names it by name in the Jewish version. Right, yeah. It's like I said, we have there's some Western issues with like, our King James Bible. We don't uh -huh. understand the Jewish background. And the tzitzit is um, it's all through, all through know, the Bible. borders and and wings. Uh huh. That's I neat. I just took the two or three. I like the Saul picture because, yeah, the fact that David suddenly realized, oh man, I should not have done that, <laughs> gives us the picture of the symbolic authority he felt towards it. Yes, because he was very sensitive. I mean, that's why he didn't hunt down Saul and kill him or have revenge on him. So mm -hmm. his heart was in the right place, and he. Kind of did something silly there and then you realize that his heart wasn't in the right place after all <laughs> thank you for explaining all that right it's a good study yeah, thanks so much, Thank Denise. I um, always, I always excited because because you always love the the Jewish. Yeah. Hi, I thought I showed my face. Hi, y'all. Okay. Oh, hey. Hi, lovely Dave. Denise. Yeah. How y'all doing? Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Sabo. Hello, Hi, Denise. Bill. Hi, Denise. Yeah. I always thought. I always, I always thought, John, that David. I didn't realize the Passover part of it. But I felt that he did that, and then he confronted Saul to show him that he could have killed him, and he didn't. Yeah, oh, yeah. So it, was, it was definitely there, because his number one question was, anybody that tries to tell you I'm trying to kill you must be crazy, because check it out. I didn't. So, I mean, he still felt bad at what he did, but didn't change the message he had for Saul. He says, I'm a loyal subject. He bowed down for him. He bowed down twice. In, in the context of bow down and then then prostrate himself he called it my lord is just he was trying to show saul how insane saul was and of course of course saul was demonically influenced in all of the stuff he was doing but but those tassels when they touched them it was showing submission and this woman yep. with the issue of but she was Showing submission mm -hmm. to Jesus. Now I thought that was so beautiful. I don't know how some of the translations got just the hem of his garment because it does refer to the tassels. Yeah. On on his uh, the, well the prayer tassels. Yeah. Well the, the Greek word and uh, the it's been on. reworded and watered down so much. Even in the King James, it says the border of his garment. Well, that's more. That was the tassels. It wasn't the right. him like yeah. we think of a him. Yeah, I, I think in addition, Order. in her submission though, was her belief he was the Messiah, right? Because that was the faith. You know, she knew she was touching the Messiah in in her mind, and that was what God the Father honored, and that's what caught Jesus by surprise. 
because she he, wanted he, he only knows what the father tells him at any given moment he shares with it but he's functioning as a human being but as a human being he's still god right and virtue goes out of him and anything that jesus did in theory we could do too in that sense if we have virtue just like if i have a chronic illness and i break a clay pot because of my issue the fact that i have virtue from god and if i'm in good standing right standing with god and i'm following the spirit who knows who god may cause to be healed through me like he did through jesus and you would feel that surge of the spirit move through you mm -hmm. probably many many ministers have anyway mm -hmm. they they feel that that urge of the spirit just like jesus it wasn't a normal touch well, exactly it, it was, was a Touch of a faith. Spiritual touch. touch of faith. Faith is what God responds to. Faith is what God loves. Faith is the only thing that you can really commune with God. Pastor Shaw is he mentioned it briefly, but the idea that I can get only so close to God and understanding Christ by reason. At some point, God says, Okay, you've come to the end of your reason, now it's time to jump. At some point, you know, at some point, it's like, I got to, I can, C.S. Lewis had a dear friend who studied and studied history in the Bible, and he finally came to the conclusion, he said, by Jove, it looks like that resurrection did happen. It was intellectual ascent to a historical anomaly. Mm -hmm. Never got saved. He said, wow, I guess, wow, I guess that happened. Didn't mean he took it personally. You know, it's, it's the joke, again, you heard Pastor, he said it, but you fall over a cliff and on the way down, you grab hold of a branch, you hang in there, you swing and say, God, God, help me. And God shouts down, let go and I'll catch you. And you go, anybody else up there? <laughs> well, you know, at some point, you, just, you take the plunge. And we do that for salvation. And all of us have a unique story in that area, but it's always we came to the end of ourselves and God's call, and He did all the work, and it's no credit for us. But our Christian life is a series of those things. You know, we can all think of that one time when He said, No, I'm not going to forgive, or I'm not going to tell a person I'm sorry. I'm, you know, and it sounds like you think your life's going to end if you go ahead and give in. And then you give in to God and you go, that was silly, that was easy. Now my life's so much better and I'm happy again. You know, and the next time we do it all over again, you know, nothing really changes except the magnitude. And hopefully we start to believe that maybe God's powerful enough for this next one as well. Yeah. He's faithful on my heart my whole life, but now there's something new him he can't handle. <laughs> yeah. Problems keep getting deeper the older we get yeah but that is how god draws us close to him this is part of his process of of intimacy and we're going to be happy for each one of those problems in heaven because i have an extra degree of glory extra degree of um christ likeness extra degrees of, of intimacy and closeness with god i will know parts of god that no one else knows because i received the healing or compassion or forgiveness for that area that maybe no one else had to deal with and we'll probably have another crown to throw at his feet yeah yeah oh yeah well i know this last year and a half has sure given me a lot more intimacy with god than i mm -hmm. ever had before and i thought i had some earlier <laughs> <laughs> well how was that can you share that with us or why was that Oh, it was going through the shingles and uh -huh. feeling like I was in hell with every uh -huh. time it was attacked in the fire. And then, of course, with the shingles, uh, the damage that was done as a result uh -huh. of the heat, uh -huh. I'm still living with that. And then, of course, having my son murdered in the middle of all that. Why? It, it, it's been a year of depending on God and listening to him and Oh. I'd say, yes, God, I accept this, and uh, I'll obey you, and pick up the pen, and, and uh, write his name in the pages of my Bible, is under death, 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just it, it constantly. God has spoken in so many intimate ways. Mm-hmm. One of the so beautiful things with heaven here on earth, because of our fallen nature, we need trials and problems to bring about intimacy. The yes, good news do. in heaven, we'll be able to increase intimacy without trials and problems. Yes. It will not it will no longer be part of the recipe, part of the necessary thing to get us to be dependent on God, because we won't have a nation that tries to avoid that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Mm. Uh, we just t- attended a funeral of someone who was a, a wonderful pastor, and well, he was a young man when you came to the Lord under the Robbins uh, ministry. He was in high school, but served the Lord for sixty years, transported to heaven, and we rejoiced for him, but. The family isn't rejoicing. No. <clears throat> well, I've I had uh, an elderly couple that I visit in Ellicott City every few weeks, and I showed up this Saturday, and he had passed. Wow! I'd missed wow. it. Oh and, wow! Um, they had been trying to find me, but I apparently I never told them how to, and bad on me. Um, oh, wow! Whereas, uh, she's still there with the caretaker, and um, that was that wasn't the couple that was over here, is it? No, no, not at all. Oh. No, no. This is these. These are in the late nineties. Wow. I've been going to their house for almost fifteen, probably even more years now. It's from the original Ellicott City Church with Pastor Phil. Oh my! So, and she's the one that had the stroke, and she's been pretty comatose for about two years now. But she responds every once in a while. Wow! And so yeah, it was a little bittersweet to go to their caretaker. Was like, oh, I'm so glad you came. I've been trying to. I've been hoping I had this to give to you. She gave me a card from the service, and wow. the family has my number now, so they want, they're trying to reach out to me. Great. Wow. You're special. Mm. Oh. So, like I say, on this side of heaven, we're always saying goodbye, but on the other side of heaven, they're always saying hello. Yeah. Oh, there you are. I've been waiting for you. Good to see you. <laughs> This is took too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, well, and uh, Becky and I texted each other yesterday. We said we're got more family members in heaven, and as they, we think of them going all the time, there's more of their family in heaven than yeah. there is left here. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm starting to anticipate that tipping point. Not yet, but I think you know, I've got both in-laws in heaven now. <laughs> it's like, shh. So, but it's it's a beautiful yeah, thing. It really is. I'm the senior uh, crowd. Mm-hmm. Well, big six O is coming. So. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To the wisdom for the wise club. And where does that, that put me? What? <laughs> If my oldest son is turning 60, where does that put me? It puts you the same place you've always been. Leslie says 60. years ahead of me. Leslie says 61. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what puts you. <laughs> you had me when you, when you were one, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so. so did the women have to go and get cleansed every month then? Um, no, remember? That's if it was a long-term issue. Only if it was long-term, okay. Yeah, that's, that's where like, the misunderstanding sometimes happens. She's unclean during those seven days or whatever it happens to be, four or five, whatever. And when yeah. that's done, then it's like a normal summer uncleanness. She wasted that evening, washes, and she's good to go. Okay. You so. know, reading that chapter, I felt like the women were unclean most of their life because they're the ones that take care of the guy who has the issue. They're washing their clothes, they're, they're taking care of them, and then they've got their own times of uncleanness, yes. which is at least one week out of every month and sometimes longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just spend their lives almost unclean most of their days. Wow, poor women. <laughs> Personal time with God. 
<laughs> we stay before the Lord. That's what it is. Well, there you go. Remember, remember, if you're in that state, people leave you alone. There you go. <laughs> you get kind of lonesome sometimes. Rachel could <laughs> vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, the stigma of unclean, I, I, for me, it's real important to say, it doesn't mean you're a sinner when you're unclean. I like that. You, let me clarify. It doesn't mean you sinned to get unclean. Right, right. It means you happen right. to be in an unclean world, and you came in contact with things, and life is going to make you unclean. It's the chronic stuff. Of course, leprosy is a special example because God chose to use leprosy as a metaphor for sin, something that was uncurable at the time. Mm -hmm. But... The, the power of the law is in the consciousness of sin. That's why the law is death. The law puts that ugly mirror in front of your face and says, you're a sinner. And that's why we don't want to spend our lives as Christians sin conscious. We study this. We appreciate what Christ did all the more because of this. We appreciate what we've been saved from. That's the way I, I like looking at that the best way. The more you realize what you've been saved from, the more you appreciate heaven. The more you appreciate where you're going to. Yeah, right. Where you're going to. You and that's and that's Great. why it, and that's why it's important to realize that salvation is more than a fire insurance policy. It's 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 a it's step. It's entrance into living a positive, real life. Right. Reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Christians, American Christianity can become very surface and become almost as ritualistic and legalistic as the old Jews were because they're not focusing on the purpose, mm -hmm. not focusing on the salvation, not focusing on who Christ is and what he did. They're just like, if I think Jesus died on the cross to make me a successful person or <laughs> give me a nice house or... <laughs> or, or or to feel good about myself, you know, I'm kind of missing the point. Prosperity gospel. Yeah. And if I want to live in that, God will let me. But I'm cheating myself. I can live in the prosperity gospel. I can live in Deuteronomy 28 and do all the good things. And, and God will check off the list and bless me like he promises to. But if there's, not, there's no relationship there. It's like, you know, God's my, as Pastor Shaw calls it, Turning God into a vending machine. Mm -hmm. Like, I put my coins in God, give me. Like, if you want to live like that, he'll let you. But don't mess up and don't, don't expect any, any rewards or blessings. It just, it's, it becomes very meaningless. It's like the meaningless of, 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 meaningless of a unsaved life. You're choosing to live that as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's it's like the Pharisees that stood on the street corners and prayed, prayed to be seen of men, you know. <laughs> what was that, Gay? So many of the churches don't even teach relationship here in Baltimore, though. You know, it's so frustrating. Most of the people that have been going to church their whole lives don't even know a relationship available. Wow. And that, and that breaks my heart. That's what I see so different from where I've come from. You know, when you've come through revival, it's all about relationship. Mm -hmm. And also, in your case, Gay, when you've been involved in mission, that's all there is. That's all, That's what it's all about, yeah. <laughs> let's face it, you were gone from America for 20-some years, and you came back and had some culture shock. I had big <laughs> culture shock. <laughs> you know, a lot of things have changed in the last 30-so years of yeah, America. Yeah, they sure as heck did. Oh. Doggone it. They sure as heck did. Mm. Thanks to you, I'm still learning. <laughs> Thank you so much. We all are. You're yes. working there again. Yep. Yeah. Are you going to go through the whole Bible like this? <laughs> I don't know what I have planned. No, I, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's great. Taking every chapter of the Bible, I think it's I good. I think at, at this point, I'm definitely going to finish up the, the Torah, the Pentateuch. Huh? Hey. The first five books. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm 
doing some others elsewhere. The one thing that I'm actually starting to get my act together on is getting these things on YouTube. There now is on my channel a Leviticus playlist. Yeah. All the Leviticus things are up and done. They have, you know, little you. title pictures. Amos is done now. Uh, Joel is done. But it's not finished. It's my older stuff. Wait a minute. This is, you can find this on what? If you go to John Sabo on YouTube, my YouTube channel. There's some, there's some channel YouTube. <laughs> Oh, Everybody you're the man. Oh, you're the man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. YouTube channel. Okay, I got to write that down there. Yeah. I mean, if you look for Leviticus on Zoom and put Sable, you'll find them. Okay. It's okay. from another account. Okay. On Zoom? On Zoom, oh. you said? The title of the series, I called it Leviticus on Zoom. Okay. Because that's where the Bible studies happened. So I don't mind using Zoom as as a keyword. Great. Very good. So well. Hello, is that your new apartment? Yeah. I thought the walls looked more bare. <laughs> well, this one is. It's not full of sixty or eighty years worth of trinkets. <laughs> Yeah. That's good. It's called a fresh start over. Well, kind of. But... <laughs> well, John, I think you handled a very delicate chapter quite yeah. well. Yes. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was good. Not, not an easy chapter to set, talk about. Well, you know, John, you know, it's real life, though. I just. Right. Yeah. Yes, John, I have a, a comment here. A couple of weeks ago at our Senate school class, we talked about different ways, like Esau uh, dissed God by rejecting his birthright and his blessings and so on. And the question that came up, how can we uh, diss our birthrights or our blessings? And I thought to myself, how you've been bringing out Leviticus and saying some people think it's boring. And I think that we can... Uh, turn away a birthright or a blessing wow. by calling something boring when God's got it there for you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. Do, not, do not call them clean. That was God has called clean. Yeah, clean. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kill and eat. Yes, that's all about it. Yeah, yeah. How to diss God. The number one way to diss God is to not receive his grace. And that's tough because Receiving grace from people gets difficult because we start feeling like we're abusing them or using too much because if you start abusing my grace too much, I might get upset. But God loves it when you use his grace, and he, he feels honored. He says, I paid a big price for it. I want to, I want to give it to you. I don't want to pay a big price and not, you, not, not have you use it. And yet we, well, don't wanna, we don't want to do like they did with back Paul. Don't don't sin that God's grace abound. You know, He doesn't want us to deliberately yeah. start do stuff either. I, I would call that not receiving grace. And I know what you're saying, and that's true. Using grace as a, as license to as sin. a Paul as a Paul told them, you know. Right, but using <laughs> grace as a license to sin means I'm appropriating it in a way it wasn't intended. Right. Okay. But grace was meant for me to take to teach me godliness and cause me to want godliness. So if I'm, if I'm abusing it, it's kind of like God gives me medicine and I don't take it the way it's prescribed. I'm just not, not using it the way it's meant to be used. I'm abusing it. It's like my mom used to eat cough drops like candy. Yeah, some people do that. You know, hey, God, if someone gives you a miracle drug and you decide to take it the wrong way and then it hurts you. And you get mad at the person that gave you the, the medicine. And that's... Not the not the doctor's fault in that case. No. So, assuming it's really even properly FDA approved and not artificially. Never mind. Okay. Oh, don't go there. Well, everyone have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. I'm just so blessed that so many people stuck with Leviticus. And like uh, Dad okay. said, it's been great. Dad, you want any closing prayer then? Uh, Heavenly Father. It is great to get 
better understanding of your holiness, mm -hmm. to, even through these laws, to realize that these laws show us your holiness and how you want us to live closer to you. Mm -hmm. Go with us the rest of this week and help us to apply and learn what your holiness is. In thy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks. Amen. Good to Thank see you. you. That was great. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, good have night. a good week. See you next week. Okay. Thank you. Night. So Thank you, Pastor John. Thanks, Jermaine. Good to hear from you. <laughs> you. I'm near, but the dogs are all barking, so I have to see the <laughs> yeah, well, I can definitely appreciate it. Oh, man. <laughs> Thanks so much. I love you all. Have a Bye. safe and blessed week. Bye.